Hi, Smack. So, so that's a good reason for Ronaldo Belomo to kill me, because I'm looking for answers from uh, physiology. So uh, not all brains are the same. The evidence for that is at the bottom of the first slide. I can move on. No, it isn't. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is trying to build a platform to personalize critical care in traumatic brain injury. Now, we've got good foundations to build that platform. In fact, from the Brain Trauma Foundation, who tell us that ICP monitoring is recommended, CPP monitoring is recommended, they give us blood pressure targets, they give us ICP targets, 22? Is that really different from 20? Anyway, a target CPP of 60 to 70. All good, but the problem is they don't tell us how to get there because there's no level one recommendation for the use of any intervention to modulate either ICP or CPP. That's a bit difficult. But intensive care doctors are nothing but uh, creative, so all of us have created protocols of our own. And some of these have come in for a bit of grief, but generally they consist of good basic intensive care, which I define as doing lots of little things very well, making sure that the blood pressure is high enough to get oxygen to the brain, optimizing oxygenation, playing with the carbon dioxide, we'll talk about that a bit more later, perhaps giving some hypertonic salt, cooling people or not letting them get hot when things get really hard, perhaps using metabolic suppression with an anesthetic agent or taking the lid off the skull. Works well. And because none of these, surprise, surprise, is risk-free, we've got to find some way of ordering them. And the way we order them is with increasing therapy intensity and side effects. And that makes good sense. So, so far, we're doing good. But there is a problem here because we don't have any evidence-based medicine support for these second-tier therapies. In fact, what we have is evidence of harm. DECRA showed that decompressive craniectomy was harmful. Eurotherm studies suggested patients did worse with hypothermia. And even the basic target and process of using intracranial pressure monitoring in BESTRIP didn't find any evidence that it pr produced benefit. So is this um, a reason for me to be struck off, go to the General Medical Council using unproven therapies? Well, we would argue not, because DECRA looked at decompressive craniectomy as a very early therapy. Eurotherm used hypothermia as an early therapy. And the BESTRIP trial used a single ICP value as its target for therapy. So why is that important? Well. When you're in doubt and you live in the UK, you go and ask Shakespeare. And what Shakespeare says is that diseases is desperate, grown by desperate appliance, are relieved or not at all. It's a bit out of context because here King Claudius was talking about getting rid of Hamlet, but still, it serves my purpose, so I'll use it. So the question we have to ask is, was the d disease desperate enough, and did we balance the risks and benefits of the therapy appropriately? Let me, let me make it a bit clearer. Let's think about intracranial pressure. There are two ways intracranial pressure might actually affect a patient. This young man who pitches up in the ED with an extradural hematoma because of a delay uh, in being able to get to us uh, wound up going to the pathology outpatient department, and that's the result of his appointment for his post-mortem. What you can see is that he's got uncle herniation that's gone down, pressed on the midbrain, and caused a Durets hemorrhage. Now, this doesn't happen with just any ICP. You probably need quite a lot of intracranial hypertension to do it. We don't know when it happens. It depends a bit on where the lesions are. But let's say it's 30. It's certainly higher than 20. And then we've got this. This is a patient with a subdural hematoma, a lady who fell down the stairs, ably assisted by a bottle of vodka. And she comes to us, has her subdural taken out. She's really oozy because she's got liver disease as well, so the bone flap's left out. She's got small contusions. And the post-operative PET cerebral blood flow scan, which is still within the first 24 hours, shows hypoperfusion underneath the residual subdural hematoma. Now, this is probably dependent on ICP as well, but we don't know what the threshold is. We've said 20, but there's evidence to suggest that there's physiological harm from lower pressures as well, so we don't know. But in any case, it depends on the cerebral perfusion pressure. Now, these are both intracranial pressure treatments, 
but uh, indications for treatment, but they're very different. They have different risks, they have different thresholds and different urgency for treatment. And consequently, for you and me, when we're treating them, we should have different acceptance of iatrogenic risk. So we need to calibrate our ICP treatments based on this risk-benefit ratio as to why we're treating them. But what about cerebral perfusion pressure? Well, cerebral perfusion pressure targets and protocols have used population averages as associations. But there's no single optimal CPP across all patients. As a consequence, we undertreat some patients and we overtreat others. And we really need some tools to titrate this therapy intensity. Otherwise, you wind up with this kind of picture. It's from our one-size-fits-none line. So if that's the case, what can we do to titrate it? How can we get the measurements of the tailoring for this therapy per patient better? Well, there's no class one evidence, but what we do in Cambridge is this. If you're unfortunate enough to turn up with a traumatic brain injury in Cambridge and you're sick enough, you'll get a triple board placed, typically in your non-dominant frontal cortex, and we put in an ICP probe, a 100 kilodalton microdialysis catheter, and a Lycox uh, brain tissue PO2 probe through that. And then we measure a variety of things, uh, autoregulation. Uh, we measure autoregulation so that we can actually try and keep the patient at the point where, or within the range where he's autoregulating best. As a consequence, they're less prone to have harm from uh, small rises or falls in, in cerebral perfusion pressure. Then we measure tissue PO2 to make sure that we're actually getting the uh, oxygen there with the blood pressure we're generating, lactate pyruvate ratio to make sure this is not anaerobic metabolism, and glucose, very importantly, uh, from microdialysis to show they've got enough substrate. Now, it's really important to declare that these are not evidence-based. They're based on associations with outcome. They're the targets that we find in survivors or people who have good outcomes. And the aim is to find a rational way of titrating treatment to physiology. Having said there's no class one evidence, it's on the way, we're in the process of putting together a trial for uh, autoregulation-based management. And I know that uh, some colleagues in the US have a grant with the NIH for Boost3, which is a brain tissue PO2 guided uh, uh, treatment. And when we get these numbers, it's useful to think about them in these three columns, what's normal, what's desirable, and what's an injury threshold, with the physiology getting worse as you go to the to the left, sorry, to the right there. And what you have uh, is an ICP of 25, maybe 30, as being much more dangerous than an ICP of just around 20, uh, and so on with the other variables. Why do you want to do this? Well, because it allows you to calibrate the intensity of the treatment, and if you remember the protocol, the side effects of the treatment that you might worry about. What you want to do is to make the juice worth the squeeze and this graded threshold allows you to escalate to the next therapy level if you need to. But very importantly, when you're using an individual treatment, you can try and minimize the side effects and the harm from it. So let's take an example of the second one first with a very, very common intervention that all of us do in patients with raised intracranial uh, pressure. We use hyperventilation. Why do we do that? Because the intracranial vessels are exquisitely sensitive to pH and carbon dioxide is a diffusible acid. You hyperventilate them, the acid comes out of the head, vessels constrict. And when the vessels constrict, intracranial volume drops. In you and me, it doesn't make much of a difference because we've got a very compliant intracranial cavity. But if your head's tight, that small reduction, remember, it's only about 1% reduction in intracranial volume, has a big effect on ICP. So that's what the line looks like within the physiological limits. But as any plumber worth his salt will tell you, if you make the pipes smaller, you won't get much through them. And because flow is proportional to the fourth power of the radius, while volume only to the square of the radius, the curve is steeper for blood flow. So the prediction would be that if you hyperventilated people, unless the intracranial pressure was really high and you made a big difference to ICP and then CPP, you would reduce perfusion. So that's a, a, a nice fancy notion, but is it true? Well, in a paper that's now 15 years old, we tried to check that. We took patients and put them in a PET scanner and measured their cerebral blood flow, and what you see is one slice from one patient. There's normally 35 slices. And there's a gray scale on the left, which is 0 to 60 mils per 100 grams per minute. And anything that's less than 20 mils per 100 grams per minute is picked out in red. 
So this was the first patient we did, and the protocol at that time, because we started doing the study in, in, the, in the late uh, 2000s, uh, sorry, 1900s, was to get the CO2 down to between 25 and 30. This first patient, we hit 25 millimeters of mercury, and this is what happened. We never got that low again. But even though we didn't get that low again, every patient we hyperventilated in the scanner showed an increase in uh, hypoperfusion across the brain. It's very important to make the point that these were all patients who had ICPs at the most in the low 20s. None of these people had really tight heads and high intracranial pressures. So that brings us to the bottom line with hyperventilation. What you want to do is to reduce intracranial pressure but avoid harm. The cerebral blood flow is generally more severe. Uh, reductions are generally more severe at 4.5 kPa. But you can actually, um, some patients will tolerate or need more than this. So you can use brain tissue PO2 to monitor that. You also need to consider why you're using CO2 reduction. If it's for a perfusion pressure improvement, then don't use an intervention that reduces perfusion. But if the patient's got a blown pupil, huge midline shift, you're waiting to go to the OR, then hyperventilate for all your worth, because that brief period of global hypoxia, partial global hypo hypoxia, can save a life. But use it briefly and to make time for another intervention. So I've talked to you about how we might titrate conventional therapies. What about third-year therapies? I talked to you about desperate disease. So this is decompressive craniectomy, not desperate disease. This is the DECRA trial from Jamie Cooper. Early decompression for an ICP over 20 for 15 minutes, first-year therapies failed, not refractory. And they found worse outcomes with uh, decompressive craniectomy. But I think this is a very important paper because it was the first paper that calibrated the relative risk of surgical versus most medical therapies that we use. But I've been telling you that we can look for a, a, a situation where you have a desperate disease, and we did that in the rescue ICP trial led by Peter Hutchison from Cambridge. We used it as rescue treatment for refractory intracranial hypertension. ICP had to be over, one, uh, over 25 millimeters of mercury for one to 12 hours, refractory to stage one and stage two therapies, followed patients up for six to 12 months, and looked at the dichotomized Glasgow outcome scale between upper and lower severe disability at six and 12 months. And this is what it looks like. You've got the, um, the Glasgow, extended Glasgow outcome scale from left to right, death, uh, vegetative state, lower severe disability, upper severe disability, moderate disability, upper and lower, and good recovery, upper and lower. When you dichotomize between upper and lower severe disability, at six months, there was no difference. But at 12 months, there was a difference. Now, there's been quite a lot of questioning of the fact that this was between upper and lower severe disability. And normally, the GOSE is dichotomized between moderate disability and upper disability. We prospectively said that in this patients, group of patients who were most severely affected, it would make sense to actually use uh, this because an upper severe disability requires independence at home for eight hours, and that's meaningful because it means a spouse or someone else can hold down a job. So some thoughts, what we need to do is to separate two patient groups, intractable intracranial hypertension as a consequence of devastating brain injury, and intractable intracranial hypertension where it's a cause. In the first case, if you've got a really badly injured head, then ICP therapies are not going to help. The outcome is going to depend on the injury, but may benefit the second. We don't know how the population divides up, but this distinction is important not just for decompression, but for all treatments. And the potential biomarkers might be the initial age, younger is better, initial GCS, higher is better, and looking for severe occult injury like diffuse axonal injury. So what do I do when I talk to families? Um, I admit uncertainty. I, I think I start from a platform that decompressive craniectomy may be the least worst option in a small group of patients. I try not to use favorable and unfavorable because they mean different things to different people. I simply state that the best evidence is that DC reduces uh, mortality by about 20%. About half of these survivors will still say comatose or very severely disabled. Half of them will uh, improve to the point at which they're at least dependent, uh, independent at home for a short period. And it takes at least a year for these full benefits to be there. I offer to provide uh, details of outcome categories and clarify issues. I say that our prediction of trajectories and outcomes is imperfect. And some families choose decompression and some do not. 
But this last thing is important because we are really very bad at this, and we don't recognize that patients can get better or worse. So what I'm showing you now is some data from Virginia Newcomb, who's in the audience and did her PhD with us. And what we looked at was serial diffusion tensor imaging, and you're looking at all the white matter fibers in the brain of a healthy control, at least a consultant neurosurgeon, for, for what that passes for. And then the same patient at two days, one week, six weeks, six months, and one year after injury. And what you can see is there's some white matter loss initially, but this goes on and carries on for up to a year after injury and correlates with the trajectory of clinical recovery. We know that there are likely to be causes for this, neuroinflammation, it might be to do with um, uh, neurodegenerative processes such as amyloid and tau deposition. And then I'm going to talk to you in my last two minutes about two different outcomes in some patients who had really bad uh, disease. The first is Kate Bainbridge, not normally able to tell you the patient's name, but you, it'll become clear why. She's not a TBI patient. She's a 26-year-old trainee teacher who had post-viral ADEM. She had a very prolonged ICU stay. She was diagnosed as vegetative. The reason I got to know her a little more, she was the first person whom we did functional imaging on and showed that patients who were in the vegetative state had cognitive processes using functional imaging, so-called covert cognition. But that's not the story now. The story is that Kate got better. So she gradually got better and went through rehab and got to the point where she published her story online and was a co-author on two peer-reviewed papers. And I say to the residents, if someone who's been in a vegetative state can publish two peer-reviewed papers, surely you can manage one. <laughs> and then she came, she, came to talk, she came to talk at a meeting rather like this for us. And at that stage, she was very dysarthric, and she was using a fingerboard. So I asked her mom, I said, We'd like to give her something as a present. Should we give her a some flowers or something? She said, oh, don't do that. She's not a flowers girl. Buy her some, some records. And she likes rock. So we got her some Queen and Led Zeppelin. And she said, I'm really pleased with that, spelled out, because I'm, I'm still a rock chick. So she didn't just recover from being in a vegetative state, but still thinks of herself as a rock chick. So that's a good news story. But in counterpoint, let me give you Polly Kitzinger. So we didn't take care of her. And, and there are many patients whom we've done this to and for. But they're not as well documented, so I'm using Polly. She was in a motor vehicle collision, managed in another hospital, severe TBI, aggressively treated. She was minimally conscious and now severely disabled. She had no advanced directive, but her wishes now are, are absolutely clear. This is a website set up by her sister. She was someone who didn't want to be bound by promises, held down to date, bad judgment. She says, I'm off, and it says Australia down there. But who knows, different people have different choices. And then me as a free spirit doesn't want to be caught. And this is what she wrote. I think I might die around when I'm 40, doing something exciting, somewhere beautiful suddenly, because I don't ever want to be less able than I was. I don't want to know I'm slowly going downhill. It is iniquitous that a patient like that winds up being severely disabled, or worse still, MCS. Or even if she's cognitively intact, as we found with some of vegetative patients, that she's trapped within her own brain. So I go for wisdom to Bon Jovi. <laughs> and what we have here is uh, what they said in, in 2000. It's my life. It's now or never. I ain't going to live forever. I just want to live while I'm alive. It's my life. But like many academic groups, they often change what they're saying. And they actually said something different in 1996. They said, we've got to hold on to what we've got, because it doesn't make a difference if we make it or not. We've got each other, and that's a lot for love, and we'll give it a shot. So I'm in the state of cognitive dissonance, actually, where I'm between Bon Jovi 2000 and 1996, often simultaneously. And I've talked to you about the worst outcomes, but it's just as true when you're thinking about getting that CPP up to save that neuron in the frontal lobe or in the temporal lobe, which makes you, you, and me, me. And I don't know that there's an easy answer for it. Thank you. Alex, we've got time for a quick question. There's, there's loads of questions. Uh, one thing to point out is the app, unfortunately, links to someone who isn't me, who has no followers and has never tweeted. So quite now, I'm not sure what they think is going on. Um, <laughs> one good question comes from someone called Christopher Nixon. I've no idea who he is. But he said, what's the societal cost of decompressive craniectomy, given there's an equivocal clinical benefit? Why do we do it? 
Um, so there's, so the, the, the formal answer is that there's a health economic analysis going on in the rescue ICP trial. But in, in actual fact, um, it's not that much more than doing decompression for stroke. It's probably not as much as for us to take many patients who've got oncological malignancies through the ICU. These are patients who will often get back uh, in half the time, uh, sorry, half the cases back to some kind of active life. The point is this, I suppose, the ones who are not going to make progress, what do we do about them? And very often there are opportunities to reconsider that decision. But traumatic brain injury particularly takes a long time to declare itself. Would it, would it be a choice I would make for myself if that was what was asked of me by someone on, on, online? And that's not the point, it's what choice that patient would make. We have to think about it in the wider economic uh, situation, though. Maybe another one, Alex. 30 um, seconds. So, another good question from emergency medicine. ED don't know the patient's ICP, so how do we target therapy when we're shooting in the dark? So, I, I think you can, um, when you start off, you maintain the mean arterial pressure, I would say at, at least 90, so that gives you, even if the ICP is 20 or 25, it still gives you a cerebral perfusion pressure of 60. If the GCS is low, you're more likely to worry about raising cranial pressure. If there's been a deterioration of the GCS, then you need to worry more about it. If you have a, a pupil that's dilating, then you may need to hyperventilate, not may, you will hyperventilate and hyperventilate down to 3.5, because what you're preventing is brainstem herniation. Uh, so I, I think you have to go by, um, by clinical signs. And all I can say, uh, thank God I'm not an ED doctor, because I have all the numbers. You guys do a fantastic job, a very difficult job. So, thank you, David.